Hebrews 2, 54, 2, 5, 4. Sixteen, two, sixteen. Yeah. 
I take it I am on now, Curtis. Is that correct? All right. Would you turn with me to 1 John chapter 5 this evening? And I want to talk to you tonight about how to know you're saved. 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. And uh, that's one of the good things about John's books, is John tells you exactly why he wrote the book. Makes it easier to understand. Now, there's more to John than just this. John uh, tells us in verse 13, tell you what, let's look at verse 13, and it says this. Are you there yet? I don't want to get ahead of you. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says this, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank You for this evening. We thank You for Your Word and Your Spirit. We thank You for the chance to be here and to listen and to learn and to grow and to be more like Jesus and to be less like the old person we used to be. And if somebody here does not know you as Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that you work in each heart and each life, that you draw those who are lost to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And whatever decision needs to be made, Lord, I pray that you would do a work that only you can do and that you'd make us more like Jesus. Thank you for all the things you've done for us and all the things you're going to do for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've talked about this as we've gone along, but John wrote this under the backdrop of Gnosticism. Those who said that Jesus is not enough. You need to know Jesus, but then you also have to have this gnosis. That's a Greek word for knowledge. This secret knowledge that will take you to this deeper level of spirituality. And so they melded Greek philosophy and biblical truth and came up with a hybrid that was not true. You know... If, uh, if you take a half-truth, it really is a whole lie, especially in this case. And they, you know, that's trouble with false teaching and Satan himself. Our job as believers is not to tell truth from untruth. Our job as believers is to tell truth from almost truth. Because almost every false teaching is going to be very close to the real thing. They don't make counterfeit bills that look completely unlike the real thing. They make counterfeit bills to look as much like the real thing as they can. And same thing for false teaching. They want it to look as much like the real thing as possible without being real. And they did that with Jesus. They tried to tell people that Jesus, that the Christ Spirit was separate from Jesus the man. And at His baptism, the Christ Spirit entered Jesus. At His crucifixion, the Christ Spirit left Jesus the man. And Jesus the man died, but the Christ Spirit lived on and never did die. And so some kind of a strange mixing of biblical truth and Greek philosophy. And in the middle of that, John writes just a profound, simple truth for us. He wrote this book so that we may know we have eternal life. Not hope so or think so, or believe so, or wish I did, maybe so, a no-so salvation. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. Several years ago at Ohio State University, a student was taking a calculus class, and he needed to do well on the final to have a decent grade in the class and continue on the program. They had a lot of students taking the the math courses. This was a class of about a 1,000 students. And the professor made it purposefully hard, and he was purposefully a jerk because he used this class to weed out a lot of people that just weren't going to make it. And in order to make it, this student needed to have a decent grade on the final. Now here's the problem. The professor didn't give him much time at all for the final. And he would sit up at the front of the class and call out every five minutes or so how much time was left until they failed the class. (laughs) <laughs> and he timed them and pressured them and let them know there's not much time left. And, and this student, who will remain unnamed, we'll call him Robert. We'll, we, will, we will obscure the names to protect the guilty. Robert, we'll call him Robert, didn't do well when he was hurried on tests and pressured. But he needed to do well. And so Robert came up with a plan. The professor 
as usual, sat at the front of the class as he'd done on every test. He sat up there and yelled out the times at the class, badgering and belittling his class, telling them how much time was left until they failed that course. And whenever the time was over, and he told everybody, pencils down, turn in your test. All the students went up the front of the class, put their stacks of paper down, and here's a stack of hundreds of students all putting their papers down together. And Robert sat at the back of the room and continued taking his test. And the professor was kind of amused at the whole thing, and so he just watched. He took his time and he took the stacks of paper, the one big stack of papers, and made several smaller stacks that were manageable for him while he waited. Eventually, Robert finished the test. He walked up to the front of the class to turn his test in, and the professor said, What are you doing? He said, I'm turning my test in. He said, No, you're not. You failed this, class, this, this test, and you failed this course. I'll see you again next semester. You fail. The student, Robert, said, Do you know who I am? And the professor, kind of indignant at this point, says, What do you mean do I know who you are? And he said, No, sir, you misunderstand. Out of this huge class of a thousand kids, do you even know what my name is? And the professor said, well, no, I don't know what your name is. And Robert took his test and slid it in the middle of a stack and walked out. <laughs> so, tonight, the question for you and me is, does God know who you are? Do you know Him? That's the question that everybody ought to know the answer to. Everybody ought to pass this test. And there really are some tests. John gives us some tests here on how to know that we're saved. How do we know that God knows who we are? How do we know that we know who God is? Is there a test that we can take to know that we have eternal life? Well, there is. John goes through this in the book of John and talks about these, these markers. Some of them are internal, some are external, some of them are subjective standards, some of them are objective standards. But you and I can examine our life and our faith and we can know that we have eternal life. Two ways that you do it. You examine the foundation of your beliefs and you examine the fruit of your behavior. So let's take the first one first. That's a good way to start, isn't it? You take the first one first. You know, let's examine the foundation of our beliefs. First of all, when you talk about your belief system, there is an eternal witness. This is the historical fact of Jesus. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. And we've already looked at this passage. We talked about that already. But verse 6 says this, This is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. We talked about that last week, actually. Those witnesses that testify to Jesus Christ. Jesus came by water and by blood. Those are two references, one of them being to His baptism, the other being to His death. Remember, the Gnostics said the Spirit, Christ's Spirit came on Jesus at His baptism, left Him in His death, and John says, no, He came by baptism. The Lord testified of Jesus Christ at His baptism, and He came at His death. The Lord testified to Jesus at His death. Both of those are true. Jesus died for you. It's a historical, eternal truth. Jesus died for you. This is the eternal work of Jesus Christ. One of the witnesses that happens there as Jesus dies on the cross is that the veil of the temple is rent in two from top to bottom. If a man did it, it would go from bottom to top. The Bible says it goes from top to bottom. God Himself 
rent that veil. That was the veil that separated the people from God. The Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, that symbolic picture that you're entering into the very presence, into the very throne room of Almighty God, and people couldn't go into God's presence. The high priest could, but only once a year he had to offer sacrifice for his sins first, and then the sins of the people of Israel. That was the cost of coming into the presence of God. Well, now that blood sacrifice has been paid. Jesus didn't have to offer a sacrifice for himself. He only had to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And Hebrews 10 says that he, this he did once. He died once for all. Jesus Christ died for you and for me. He died for the sins of the world. An eternal witness of salvation. So if you're going to be saved, if you're going to know you're saved, the first thing that you have to do is you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to know what Jesus did for you. You have to trust that for your salvation and depend on that. If Jesus doesn't save you, nothing will. Jesus died for you and me. The Holy Spirit testifies that. That's what John says there. The Spirit bears witness. The Spirit testifies to that saving of Jesus Christ. Jesus died to save you and me. That's the eternal witness. That's that objective standard, that biblical objective truth. Jesus died for you, for me, for the sins of the world. That's an eternal witness. But there's also an internal witness. And this, this is more of a subjective standard here, that internal witness. 1 John 5, 6 talks about that and says, And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. He's speaking there about the Holy Spirit. Verse 9 of 1 John 5 says this, If we confess, excuse me, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. The Holy Spirit is God's witness, His testimony to the truthfulness of Jesus Christ. And John says, if you you believe in Jesus, you have this eternal, internal witness within yourself. Romans 8.16 says this, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So, you get saved. You give your heart to Jesus Christ. You place your trust in that eternal truth that Jesus died for your sins. He left heaven, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, and rose again on the third day. Jesus Christ died for you rose from the dead, is stronger than sin, death, hell, and the grave, and you have decided to place your trust in that fact that if you're going to go to heaven, it's because of what Jesus Christ did for you. When you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart and never leaves you. And the Holy Spirit is a witness to you internally that you know Jesus Christ. There's that eternal witness. That's the truth of who Jesus is. There's that internal witness. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and letting you know that you know Jesus Christ personally and intimately and that Jesus knows you. And then there is the external witness. The Word of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 says this, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his the record that God gave his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name. See, you get where we're going here? There is a record. It's a written down record. John says, that's why I wrote these things, is so that you may believe in Jesus Christ, and in doing so, you may know that you have eternal life. There's this eternal witness. That's the truth about Jesus. There's an internal witness. That's the Holy Spirit that testifies that you know Him. And there's that external witness, the Word of God, that tells us who Jesus is and why He came. So let me ask you this. And I, listen, I'm not going to ask everybody to get stand up here and give a testimony or anything like that. Maybe one or two of you. 
Chris will be ready. Maybe one or two of you, but I'm not going to ask everybody to stand up and give a testimony or anything, but uh, just maybe nod your head a little bit, just a little bit. How many of you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Nod your head just a little bit, will you? So, all right, you don't have to nod from here on out. But do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? If so, the Bible tells us about Jesus. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe what the Bible says about Jesus? That Jesus Christ died for your sins, rose from the dead. Those objective truths about Jesus. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? That leads you to Jesus. You believe Jesus Christ died for your sins. You're willing to trust Jesus and His righteousness that that's what's going to save you and nothing else. And the Holy Spirit now testifies inside of you that you have received those truths and made them a part of your life. That is examining the foundation of your belief. Do Do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe what the Word of God says about Jesus? Have you trusted Jesus Christ and His righteousness for your salvation? Do you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart to let you know that Jesus has saved you? You can know you're saved. That's the test. How are you doing so far? We're halfway there. Are you passing the test? Examine the root of your belief. But then secondly, you need to examine the fruit of your behavior. Some of those things are are internal, some of these things are external, some are subjective, some are objective, but all of these are ways that we can test our faith to know that we have eternal life. Here's a test. When we're examining the fruit of our behavior, the commandment test. 1 John chapter 2 Verses 3 through 6 says this, And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoso keepeth His word in Him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in Him. He that saith, He abideth in Him, ought Himself so so ought so so to walk, even as He walked. I, I got that almost correct. Y'all, y'all get the idea, right? The commandment test. If you are saved, one way that you know you're saved is you obey God's Word. If we say, if we say we're saved, we keep His commandments. How many of you do that perfectly? How many of you are perfect? Anybody, anybody in here done what was right all your life, every single time, never done anything wrong? Nobody? Nobody? Raise your hand. If you, just me. I'm the only one. Huh? Nobody else? No. Doesn't mean you don't need that. Keeping God's commandments does not mean you're sinless. If we were sinless, we wouldn't need Jesus. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, John says, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar, and the truth isn't in us. It doesn't mean we're sinless. But it means that we have given our heart to Jesus, and as a result, God has changed our life, changed our desires. God has given us a new nature and new desires, and now we want to keep the commandments of God. We want to do what's right. That word keep, you keep His commandments, it's a sailing term, and it describes using the stars to keep your direction. It's how sailors would navigate before they had all these compasses and electronic compasses and things like that on boats and you know these internal navigation systems that they have now. This was the day when sailors had to figure out sort of on their own where they were at and where they needed to go. They would use the stars to keep their direction. The Word of God is a guide for our life. We keep our direction by God's Word. We may get a little off course sometimes. We're not perfect, and we mess up sometimes, but the the direction of my life is going toward God and His Word. I am keeping His commandments, certainly not perfectly. If you uh, study anything about sailing, especially years ago when they would use the stars, often sailing would involve taking a series of course course 
corrections. They didn't just sail in a straight line straight to where they were going. It often included corrections and adjustments along the way, and so does our life. We're walking with God, keeping His commandments. It may take a correction sometimes. We get a little off course. We have to re reorient ourselves toward that true north, Jesus Christ and God's Word. And so we're following His commandments. We get a little off course. We correct ourselves. But the general trajectory of our life now means we are keeping God's commandments. Do you keep His Word? Does it grieve you when you don't? The commandment test. That's the fruit of your behavior. We've already examined the root of our beliefs. Now we're examining the fruit of our behavior. There's the commandment test. Do you keep His commandments? Here's another test. The companion test. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not, brother, abideth in death. If you are saved and you love Jesus, you will love what Jesus loves. And Jesus loves His church. Jesus died for the church. Let me be even more specific. Jesus loves Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Died so that we could be saved and so we could gather together. Going to church doesn't save you. But if you're saved, you'll want to go to church. There's more to being a Christian than going to church. But they're certainly not less. And some people think there is. Some people are under the mistaken impression that you can love Jesus and not love the things Jesus loves. John says if you're saved, you'll love the brethren. The companion test. Do you love being around other Christians? I, I don't get me wrong. I Listen. Some of y'all are easier to love than others. I'm not going to call any names here tonight. Some of y'all are easier to love than others. Some of y'all feel the same way about me. Some of you love me more than other people love me. I get that. Some days my wife loves me other than other days. I understand that. But I'm telling you, there's just something, there's something inside of you that makes you want to be around other people who love Jesus. I love Jesus. And it excites me to be around other people who love Jesus. The companion test. And then there's the commitment test. We read these verses already. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 says it. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. Verse 13 says it. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. In the Bible, the words believe and commit are the same Greek word. They come from the same root. So when we talk about believing in Jesus Christ, we're talking about being committed to Jesus. Not just giving mental assent to a certain set of facts, we're talking about receiving those facts and letting those facts change the course and trajectory of your life. Jesus changes you if you are saved. That ver As a matter of fact, that word is used. Here, listen to this. John chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 says this. says that they believed in Jesus, but He did not commit Himself to them. That's the, I'm, that's the shortened version of those verses. They believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not commit Himself to them. <laughs> they believed in Jesus, but Jesus didn't believe in them. Do you know why? In Jesus' day, there were some people who just came to see the miracles and taste the food and feel good. But they certainly weren't willing to follow Jesus even unto death. They wanted the show, but they weren't willing to go. 
They believed about Jesus. I suspect, especially in the South, I don't know how many, but a lot, I think. There are a lot of people on church rolls who have been baptized who profess to be believers that believe about Jesus, but not in Him. They are professors of Jesus without being possessors of Jesus. They are Christians in name only, but they don't know Him. Jesus warns about that in Matthew chapter 7. He says, there are, on the day of judgment, there will be people who say, didn't we do many miracles in your name, cast out devils? Didn't we do all these good works? And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Here's the test. Does Jesus know who you are? Do you know Jesus? 1 John 10 510 that we read says this, He that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. You have this witness in yourself that you're saved because you believe in Jesus. That word believe is a present tense verb there. I got saved when I was young. And I have not always lived for Jesus like I should have. I know you all are shocked to hear this, but your pastor is not perfect. And I have not lived for Jesus like I should have all all the years of my life. Now the course and trajectory of my life has been for Jesus, but I haven't done that perfectly along the way. And along the way when I was younger, you know, occasionally when I would sin, I would question and ask myself was that decision I made as a youngster real and legitimate did I know what I was doing did I understand and did I make a real commitment to Jesus one of the things one of the things that I have learned over the years is it was a real decision and I believed in Jesus then because I believe in Jesus now you see in order for me to believe in Jesus now and to really mean it and I do I really know Jesus and I really believe in Him. In order for that to be true now, it had to have been true at some point in my past. That decision had to have been real. We went through the Kentucky Derby when we lived up there. I didn't gamble or anything, so don't worry. But we did go to the Kentucky Derby. We just went on a tour of Churchill Downs. Man, we see some of those horses in there, and those are some high-dollar horses, thousands and thousands of dollars, some of those horses. And they talked about that there at the Kentucky Derby, the way that they break horses. We're used to seeing cowboy movies, you know. And the way you break a horse is you jump on a bronc's back, and you ride it till it's broke. And you know it's broke, Because when you went in there, you couldn't put a saddle on it and ride it. When you go out, there's a saddle on that thing and you can ride it. You know it's broke. But guess what? They don't let you do that with horses that they paid thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for. In order to break a horse there, they start off by just standing next to it. Then maybe they'll put a blanket on it. Maybe then they'll try to put just a harness around its neck, no bit in its mouth or anything. And so little by little, they get that horse used to being, uh, having objects put on, placed on that horse, a blanket, a saddle, a harness, a bit in its mouth eventually. They'll hook it up to one of those, I don't even know what you call them, I can't remember, but the things that walks a horse around and they'll walk around. Maybe somebody will walk with it. and And eventually, eventually, slowly and over time, that horse is broken. And you can ride it. So at the end of the process, which horse is broke? The bronc that they jumped on its back or the stallion that they did slowly? Well, both of them, right? The um, result may not, has been, may not be as dramatic for one as the other, but the end result is both those horses are broke. So I got saved when I was young. And the result... If you look at my life and, and examine it, it may not be as dramatic as the guy who was a murderer or a drug dealer, some guy that was on Skid Row that gave his heart to Jesus and it happened instantly and it was, you know, it was overnight miraculous. The Lord worked on me slowly 
and over time. Because whenever I was born, Mom sang songs to me like, Jesus loves the little children and amazing grace. And then I went to Sunday school and I learned about Jesus and I learned songs from Miss Debbie's Sunday school class and I went to RAs and I learned about people who went to other countries to teach people about Jesus. I heard the preaching of the Word of God week after week. I saw people going and giving their lives to Jesus, being baptized, and I saw people taking the Lord's Supper and wondered why I couldn't do that. And over time, the Lord revealed to me my lostness and my need for a Savior, and I gave my heart to Jesus, and I got saved. And my testimony may not be as dramatic as some, but saved is saved. In the end, whether your that outward transformation was dramatic or subtle, I'm telling you, inside, it is a radical, eternal difference. You give your heart to Jesus. He forgives you of your sins. He gives you His righteousness. And He takes your sinfulness. And you are eternally and gloriously saved. And you can know it. You examine the root of your beliefs. And you examine the fruit of your behavior. And you look at your life. And you see if you know Jesus. Jesus. Do you know Him? Do you love Him? Will you live for Him? I want to pray a prayer tonight. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. You can. You can know that you have eternal life. Right here, right now, tonight. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you want to be saved, you can. You pray this prayer with me. If you mean this prayer, if you're sincere, Jesus will save you, forgive you of your sins, and give you new eternal spiritual life right here, right now. Whether you're here or whether you're watching this online, Jesus will save you. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to save me. I turn from my sins and I turn to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now help me to live for you. Amen. We're going to have a hymn of invitation tonight. Maybe you prayed that prayer with me and you want to make that public. Maybe you're watching this online. If you prayed that prayer with me, will you let me know that? I want to talk with you. I want to pray with you. Let me know about that decision. Maybe you're hearing there's some other decision you need to make. Maybe you have been saved, but there's some sin in your life and you need to repent of that sin, rededicate your life to Jesus. Maybe you want to join our church. Maybe you want to be baptized. You've been saved and you want to follow the Lord in baptism or maybe some other decision. Maybe you just need to be praying at this altar. Maybe something else. Whatever decision you need to make, if Jesus is calling, you step out right now and come.